Good evening. Welcome to Sunday Evening Online. So glad that you can join me again as we consider God's Word together. You know, we've been studying on Sunday mornings how the return of Christ and the realities that await us in, at the end of redemptive history, how those things frame up our lives, how they actually motivate us in our battle against the flesh and our pursuit of true holiness and sanctification. And so I thought it would be helpful, even as I reflected on the importance of that in my own life as I have worked through that passage with you and thinking about the emphasis the Apostle Paul put on it, I thought it would be helpful and appropriate for us to really consider the realities of Christ's return as well as our eternal home on Sunday evenings together this month. I don't think we reflect enough on these things, and we've been reminded of that, and I just want to spend some time myself, and I want us to spend some time thinking and considering these things together. So over the next several weeks, we're going to be considering two messages that I preached actually a number of years ago as part of our series, Hold Fast, and uh, I'm encouraged to go through them with you again. They are just as timely and helpful for us today as they were when I preached them a number of years ago. So I hope you will benefit from it. I know I'm looking forward to it. Let's open our time together in prayer. Our Father, we are quick to acknowledge to you that we live locked in time, that we live as the products of our era, as those who are um, content to live within the years you've given us here. And yet, Father, we know that we weren't made for this. We know that we were made for eternity. Our souls are restless here. We know we're sojourners. And yet, Father, we don't think enough about these things. And I pray that tonight and in the coming weeks as we consider the return of our Lord, as we consider our eternal home, Lord, lift our eyes. Help us to set our affections on things above. Help us to, in a fresh way, recognize what awaits us, and may that motivate us for lives of service and holiness here. Lord, use your truth in all our lives, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's turn to God's Word together. This morning, we return to our summer series, Hold Fast, the Forgotten Truths which we must always remember. And today we come to one of those truths that is at the bedrock of the Christian faith. The gospel of Jesus Christ ends with a grand finale called the second coming. The second coming is one of the cardinal doctrines of the Christian faith. 23 of the 27 New Testament books refer to the second coming. The Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, the Athanasian Creed, and all of the major confessions of the Christian church speak of the second coming. The early church fathers, even at that early stage in the life of the church, understood and affirmed the reality of the second coming. For example, the Didache, which is the earliest Christian document outside of the New Testament, dates to the first century, says this, The Lord shall come, and all His saints with Him. Then shall the world see the Lord coming upon the clouds of heaven. Justin Martyr, writing in the second century, said here too how he was to ascend into heaven according to prophecy, and how he should come again out of heaven with glory. Irenaeus, writing in the second century, was even more specific. He said, when this Antichrist shall have devastated all things in this world, he will reign for three three years and six months and sit in the temple in Jerusalem. And then the Lord will come from heaven in the clouds in the glory of the Father, sending this man and those who follow him into the lake of fire. This has been what Christianity has always taught. And of course, Christianity still tacitly acknowledges the reality of the second coming. But frankly, if you examine the sermons of today's contemporary church, if you look at the books that are published, if you listen to the prayers that are prayed, you will find that the church has largely forgotten in a day-to-day way 
the reality of the second coming. But beloved, you and I who want to cling to the foundations of the faith once for all delivered to the saints, we must hold fast to this practically forgotten truth, Jesus will return. Now, when we talk about Jesus coming, there is first of all His first advent. That's when He came into Be- in Bethlehem and became fully human as He continued to retain His deity. He became one of us. That's the first advent. The second advent points to the second return. And the, the second advent unfolds theologically in two related but distinct events. The first event in the second advent is the rapture. That's what you and I are waiting for when Christ comes for the saints and takes us back to heaven with Him just before the judgments are unleashed on this planet in the great tribulation. And then comes the second part of the second advent. There's the rapture, and then there's the second coming. Again, related but distinct events. So what are the differences between the rapture and the second coming? Let me just briefly give you a comparison. In the rapture, there is no hint of judgment. In the passages that describe the rapture, there's no hint of judgment. There's, there are no warning signs that precede it. On the other hand, when you look at the second coming, there is an emphasis on judgment, and there are dramatic signs that precede it. When you look at the passages on the rapture, you will find that the focus is on the rapture of living believers and includes the resurrection of dead believers. When you look at the second coming, that's not true. When you look at the rapture, you find in timing it is before the tribulation. Christ comes in the air, not all the way to the earth, for His saints to take the saints to heaven. When you look at the second coming passages, you find that it happens after the tribulation. Christ returns not just in the air, but all the way to the earth. He puts His feet on the Mount of Olives. He comes with His saints, already with Him in heaven. He comes back to earth to defeat His enemies and to establish His kingdom. Two related but distinct events. One before the tribulation, one after. We wait for the rapture. Those living during the period of the tribulation will await the second coming. But today, I want us to examine the second aspect of the second advent, the revelation of Jesus Christ in His second coming, because that is the culmination of human history. Jesus explains it for us in Mark chapter 13 in the text that we read together this morning. Now, Mark 13 is commonly called the Olivet Discourse because of where Jesus preached it. He was sitting on the Mount of Olives, looking back across the Kidron Valley at the Temple Mount. He had just come from there, and as he sat on the Mount of Olives, looking across the city of Jerusalem, his disciples asked him several questions, and this sermon is, in essence, a response to those questions. Now, when I taught through the Gospel of Mark, I preached eight sermons on this chapter, so we're not going to cover anything like that detail this morning. If you want more detail, you can go back and listen to those messages. But let me just give you an overview of the first two sections of this sermon, just so you get the flow of the context. First of all, in verses 5 to 13, you have what Jesus calls the beginning of birth pangs. These verses cover the time from Christ's ascension in the first century all the way through the church age to the midpoint of the future tribulation period, at the middle of that seven-year period, at three and a half years through the tribulation. So understand then that the events are described in chapter 13, verses 5 through 13, occur throughout the church age, and they will occur during the first three and a half years of the tribulation, but with much greater intensity and frequency. Think of it like this. These things are happening now, but they're like the Braxton Hicks contractions that a woman who's pregnant experiences. They're not the real birth pangs. They're sort of false alarms. But you get to the three and a half years that begin the tribulation period, and these things will be the beginning of birth pangs. They will come in much greater frequency and intensity. What are they? Well, Jesus says there will be false Christs, prophets, 
predictions of his coming. There will be war, natural disasters. There'll be intense persecution of God's people, and the gospel will be preached around the globe. Again, you can see how those things are happening now in sort of Braxton Hicks contractions, but they are coming one day in the beginning of the tribulation with real birth pangs. Now, the second section of Jesus' sermon here about the future is in verses 14 to 23, and it's the great tribulation. Not just the seven-year period, the tribulation, but the great tribulation, which covers from the midpoint of that seven years, at three and a half years, through the final three and a half years, until the second coming. This is the great tribulation, when things really intensify. Now, this is initiated, according to Jesus, by an event called the abomination of desolation. We learn from both the Old Testament, from from Daniel's prophecy, as well as from the Apostle Paul and Thessalonians, that what will happen is that the Antichrist, a political figure, a dominating political figure who will be raised at that time, will set up an image of himself in a rebuilt temple in the city of Jerusalem and demand worship of himself. That is the abomination of desolation, and that marks the beginning of this second three and a half years of the tribulation. That entire period of time will be marked by the persecution of Israel. It is described by Jesus as a time of unparalleled tribulation. He says there's nothing ever happened like this. It will be shortened for the sake of the elect, but it will be a time that will be filled with spiritual deception. That's the second three and a half years of the seven-year tribulation. This morning, however, I don't want to look at either of those sections of Jesus' sermon. I want us to turn our attention briefly to the third section of the Olivet Discourse, which is the second coming, in verses 24 to 27 that we read just a few moments ago. I'm not going to reread it, but I do want you to notice in verse 24 how it begins with the little word, but. That marks a crucial transition. It's a transition between the appearance of all the false messiahs that Jesus has just predicted and the future appearance of the true messiah. Jesus is essentially saying, listen, don't be confused. The fact that there'll be lots of false messiah sightings doesn't mean that the real messiah isn't coming. And so he talks about the second coming. Now, he begins by laying out for us the timing of the second coming. Now, if you're biblically literate, you know that Jesus was very clear that no one knows the exact time of his return. In Matthew 24, verse 36, he said, But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven. The angels don't know when the second coming's coming. And he says, Nor the Son Likely, that's a reference to the fact that while he was on the earth, Jesus voluntarily voluntarily limited the exercise of his divine attributes, including his omniscience, and so while he was here, he himself didn't know the timing of the second coming. But the Father alone, so no one knows the exact timing of the second coming, but Jesus does give us a general time frame. Look at verse 24. But in those days, after that tribulation, in other words, in the general time period following the end of the seven-year tribulation that he's just described in verses 14 to 23, but Matthew tells us Jesus made it even clearer because Matthew quotes Jesus as saying that day in Matthew 24, 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days. So the second coming then immediately follows the seven-year tribulation period. That's the timing of the second coming. Now, Jesus next identifies the signs surrounding the second coming. It's interesting because, again, Matthew quotes something Jesus said that day that Mark doesn't. In, In Matthew 24, verse 27, Jesus describes his second coming like this. As the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. 
Just like at night you can't miss a lightning strike, no one will miss this. It may even be a reference, the way he describes it, to horizontal lightning. The other night, my family and I went to uh, dinner over in Dallas, and we were riding back as the storm was in the distance, and we saw one of those horizontal lightning strikes. And I was reminded of the fact that I read at one point that the longest horizontal lightning strike ever recorded in human history was here in Dallas. And they think it measured 180 miles in length. But the bottom line is, when lightning occurs in the middle of the darkness, you see it. You don't miss it. And that's Jesus' point. It will be visible to everyone. Now, how will God accomplish that? Well, he'll do so through a series of cosmic signs. Again, Luke gives us some further insight into what Jesus said that day. Luke 21, 25, and 26. There will be signs in sun and moon and stars, and on the earth dismay among the nations. In perplexity at the roaring of the sea and the waves, men fainting from fear and the expectation of the things which are coming upon the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken." Jesus says, not a single person on this planet will miss these signs. And the terror of these signs will create an epidemic of heart attacks around this globe. These signs will come at the end of the tribulation and immediately precede the second coming. Now look at verses 24 to 26, and you will see that much of what Jesus says in these verses it, it consists of quotations from the Old Testament. Whenever you see capital letters, all capitals, in our New Testament, that's the translator's way of telling you these are quotations taken from the Old Testament. So as was his habit, Jesus is here basing his teaching on the Old Testament. He's grounding our hope in the prophetic word. Jesus' teaching is not in conflict with the Hebrew Old Testament, but rather it's a perfect explanation of it. Now notice in verses 24 and 25, Jesus explains that immediately preceding His coming, there will be clear signs, catastrophic cosmic disturbances. The first of these disturbances is in verse 24, the sun will be darkened. But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened. Jesus may be quoting here from several different Old Testament texts because there are several that contain this wording. Maybe from Isaiah 12, Isaiah 13, Isaiah 34, Ezekiel 32, Joel 2, Joel 3. You can see there are a number of places in the Old Testament where this wording occurs. Regardless, Jesus is speaking about a real event that will occur in the future. Now, when he says the sun will be darkened, he may mean that the light of the star that we know as the sun will itself be diminished or extinguished. Uh, that's certainly possible. He's God. He can do that if he chooses. Or he may mean that from the vantage point of earth, it will appear as though the sun has been darkened. Regardless, either way, it's a miraculous event brought about by God Himself. The reason I say it may appear as though the sun has been darkened is because there is a remarkable similarity between what Jesus describes here and the sixth seal recorded in Revelation. You remember the book of Revelation is a story of what will happen in the future as God brings judgment into this world during the tribulation period, and that judgment is described in a series of judgments as Jesus takes the, the scroll in Revelation 5, which is the title deed to the earth, and it's sealed with seven seals. And as he breaks each of those seals to open the title deed to the earth, more judgment rains down on the world. In the sixth seal, there comes a catastrophic earthquake. This is Revelation 6.12. When he broke the sixth seal, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth made of hair. There will be a great earthquake, John tells us, surpassing all so far, and the sun will become black like sackcloth. Now again, God could simply diminish the intensity of the sun, 
But it may be that in, res- in response to the earthquake and as a result of the earthquake, there are volcanic eruptions that follow that earthquake and the ash and soot rise into the atmosphere and block man's view of the sun, making it appear black as sackcloth. That leads to a second cosmic disturbance. Not only is the sun going to be darkened, but the moon will be darkened as well. Again, whether the sun itself is diminished in intensity or whether something obscures our view of it, obviously, since the moon reflects the sun's light, the moon too will be affected by this. Verse 24, and the moon will not give its light. Again, in Revelation chapter 6, verse 12, as a result of that that great earthquake and the resulting volcanic eruptions and the ash and soot, it says the whole moon became like blood, darkened, where you cannot see it in its full light and intensity. Here in Mark 13, Jesus adds a third cosmic disturbance, and that is that the stars will fall. Verse 25, and the stars will be falling from heaven. Now, understand that in Greek, the word translated stars is a generic word that refers to all bodies in what we would call space. It can refer to actual stars as we know them, like our sun. It can also refer to meteors and even comets. The word is used that way. And so you have to keep that in mind when you see it here. In, In Greek, the description is very graphic here. The the tense of the Greek verb pictures a duration of time as humanity watches star after star fall. When you take that Greek word into, into light, there are two possibilities of what our Lord means here when He says the stars will be falling. It may be that the actual stars, like our sun, will somehow leave their rotation and veer off into space appearing to people here on this planet as falling. That is possible. Another option, though, and I think the more likely, is that it describes meteors that will shower the earth. I say that's more likely because it is more similar to what Revelation describes. Revelation seems to hint that there will be a relentless series of meteors that will impact the earth's atmosphere and surface. In the seal, trumpet, and bowl judgments described in Revelation, there are some specific meteor impacts with earth that are described. Let me give you some examples. For example, back in that sixth seal, in Revelation chapter 6, verse 13, we learn that the stars fall. Again, that word is a generic word, likely here referring to meteors. So there is a meteor storm that causes a massive worldwide chain of earthquakes. Those earthquakes will be followed by volcanic eruptions from which ash and soot will obscure the sun and the moon. And as a result, Revelation 6.14 says, the sky will split apart. Likely that's a reference to earth's atmosphere being radically damaged and Revelation 6.14 says, every island and mountain will be moved. In other words, as a result of the impact of that, those meteors and the earthquakes that result, the, the tectonic plates of this planet will shift radically and dramatically. That's the sixth seal. Later, as judgment unfolds, in the second trumpet judgment... Recorded in Revelation chapter 8, verses 8 and 9, another meteor ignites in the earth's atmosphere and upon impact with the earth's surface creates a huge tidal wave in earth's oceans. It kills a third of the living creatures in the oceans and it destroys a third of the world's ships, swamping those at sea, inundating those in harbors around the world. And that same judgment describes that the world's oceans will become blood. Could be literal blood, or it could refer to a red tide, an event that's caused by the death of millions of tiny organisms. You can Google and see a picture of small red tide events on this planet, but this one will be massive because it will result from a meteor's collision with our Earth's ocean. 
In the third trumpet judgment, recorded in Revelation chapter 8, verses 10 and 11, John speaks of a great star, possibly another meteor or maybe a comet, enters the earth's atmosphere, shatters into pieces, falls to earth, and poisons a third of the earth's fresh water supply. Now, I think you understand that 97% of the water on this planet is saline. It's in the oceans of our world. Only 3% of the water on the planet is fresh water. And it's interesting because that fresh water supply is isolated in some major pockets. For example, 21% of that 3% fresh water on the planet is in our Great Lakes. But regardless, with this meteor described in Revelation 8, 33% of the world's fresh water will be poisoned. So Jesus says, listen, stars, or, or probably better, meteors, will be falling from heaven. Lord willing, we'll pick up there again next week as we continue to look at the amazing truths surrounding the return of our Lord. My prayer is that these truths will become more precious to each of us as we think about and reflect on the reality that He is coming again. Let's pray together as we finish our time. Father, I pray that you would seal these wonderful truths to our hearts. Lord, make, make it real to us that our Lord is going to return, that we are going to see him. We thank you that he'll return for us who are his bride, and Lord, that then we will return with him in the second coming, even in these uh, amazing verses that we're looking at from Mark's gospel. I pray that you would help us to grasp them, and most of all, Father, to live in the light of them. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, good night, and have a great week.